All right, Stephanie, welcome to the show. I am super excited to have you on here. First of all, you're a girl after my own heart. You're into the holistic movement. You're mostly carnivore or are carnivore. Um, and then you kind of got into this um, because of your nephew, you said, and I've, that's kind of a similar story to myself, actually, which you may not know. Um, my son had some psychiatric issues going on and we started our health journey with something called the DAP, the GAPS diet, which you're probably familiar with. Um, so sure. we have a lot in common and I'm really happy to have you. I am so excited to be here. I gotta tell you, like, um, my niche is brain optimization and particularly mental health and kind of developed into the autism and, and uh, learning disordered community. But I started off as an athlete. So when I look at, you know, folks like you and your pictures and your training and you're all ripped, I'm like, oh man, I totally thought I was going to be like that. <laughs> I, I kind of devoured a whole nother avenue of the healthscape. But so I covet you in many ways and <laughs> at times and what you stand for. I just stand for a way of doing it. I kind of hack the brain and I do, I, I lift weights in the brain kind of a thing through a lot of uh, technology. Well, I love it. So I guess could be said likewise about myself and your situation. So it, we're, we're, <laughs> all, we're all a big piece to this puzzle, right? And so that's part of what's yeah. so great is our individualities. And I love that about yeah. it. So. I love that everybody works, you know, we all have our like zone of genius, you know what I mean? And when people will say, like, they'll see, I, I promote rest a lot and I've kind of downplay exercise, like, because I have um, so many really sick patients that can't, like, if you can't figure out how to help somebody with chronic fatigue without telling them to go to the gym, then you're just incompetent. So I have got to figure out all this bizarre, wild stuff to, to mimic exercise, you know, in the body to get that, you know, kind of stress response with other hormetic interventions outside of exercise. Right. Um, anyway, so I just kind of, it's an interesting thing. So I, I refer to you guys, but it was always expected. I was going to kind of go in the orthopedic, uh, sports med space and I didn't. That's awesome. Well, so first of all, before we get rolling too fast here, can you explain to my listeners, who you are, what you do, what you're all about, and what got you going with it? Uh, sure. So um, I'm a holistic functional nutrition and functional medicine doctor. I'm actually a doctor of chiropractic, and I'm actually board certified in neurofeedback. Um, I specialize in brain issues. And although I'm a chiropractor, I'm primarily known for mental health issues. Uh, really, really good at things like bipolar, schizophrenia, um, uh, suicidal uh, recovery, let's say drug addiction, and then autism and all the other learning disorders and things that go with that, the OCD and tics and dyslexia. So I kind of developed these passions for um, a few things for my own family that led me into like trying to help somebody I cared about, right? So when you <clears throat> everything works for me. I'm very into frequency. So you kind of start taking care of something, you get good at it, and then it, it just attracts everybody. That's all you do for many years. And you do something else because somebody in your family or a friend came to you and had that problem. Well, you got to fix it. You're going to figure it out. And then you attract all that. So my career over 20 something years, I've been in private practice, has had its ups and downs or different uh, HIV for a long time. I was doing that community for a long time, which led to anxiety and depression and suicidal thinking because of that, which led then to my nephew being diagnosed with autism, which led to a whole another shebang of things. But so I see people uh, in practice and I have focused, I've de developed, I've gone the range of manual, right? Physical adjusting, trying to address the way the nervous system responds, trying to flip people in their fight or flight or the rest and digest and to promote healing to uh, the chronic field, the chakra system, the field, the energetic, the electromagnetic frequency field. I had to study that as related to how the brain it was created this field and how the heart was. So I was blending a lot of um, biology and anatomy with quantum uh, physics and how we call it quantum biology. And when I started going into the brain work, these two things just everything was merging so strongly. And as I started doing neurofeedback, which is training the brain to kind of rewire it, uh, teaching people to do it themselves. Um, it led me even deeper into looking at frequencies, electromagnetic frequencies, 
brain waves, which are electrical impulses and waves, and how they connected with the earth. So I had to then start studying um, the planet systems and the frequencies and resonances that the earth were giving off and then what the human system was giving off and like how they were the same. So it led me to this, you know, this macrocosm to the microcosm within it down to the electrons and the mitochondria, which is then the macrocosm to the universe. So what the earth was doing and to what the star systems were doing. So it's been a very fabulous spiral helical journey from atomic structure to quantum biology to physics. And I've had to find mentors in all these very bizarre fields to blend what I actually do, which is really just help sick people get well and well people get optimized, primarily focusing on brain performance. I love that. And who couldn't benefit from better brain performance, especially I feel like in these times, I know this sounds a horrible thing to say, but I feel like people get dumber and dumber and they don't even realize it. Right. I think a lot of it has so much to do with all these things that we have from the outside that we're being exposed to. We have our food, we have like, like all these toxins around us. We have electromagnetic fields that we don't even realize are going on. There's like a million things. And so we don't realize that we're getting foggier and foggier. And some people start to notice, they're like, geez, my memory just isn't very good right now. Or um, boy, I just can't th think straight lately. And you hear a lot of these comments in society. Um, what people don't realize is that it's a real thing. It's happening. Yeah, there's an absolute, I think there's been a war on uh, on the human system, to be honest, outside of even neurology, I think there's a war on the human system to make us smaller, weaker, dumber. And we can look back and at the fossils and it records and completely they can show us that. Our brains were bigger 15,000 years ago. 10,000 is about when agriculture started, we, our bones got weaker, our brains got smaller we became shorter, <laughs> we became dumber. Uh, and we can just look at IQs of the last 50 years. They are lower today than they were 50 years ago. So although we have this onslaught of information, the ability of the brain to actually uh, handle that information, process it, have critical thinking and actually create some wisdom uh, is, has been, there is an assault and it's coming from all of those ways. And everything you said to me kind of just comes down to making you forget what it means to be human. That to me is the ultimate abomination that we're dealing with in healthcare and the crisis of many things that are going on with the electrification of the planet and the technological war that we're seeing being assaulted on the earth and on humanity. Um, and I don't know if that's just too much for to me to say for this kind of conversation, but that's what it is. It's We have forgotten what it means to be human. And human beings are an animal species that are connected to the divine nature of the planet Earth, a, a giant rock <laughs> hurling through space that gives off electromagnetic pulses. And we are supposed to sink into that pulse. It entrains our brain in how to perform. And the more we become disconnected to what the Earth is telling our brain to do, the more chaotic and disoriented we become, right? Amen to this. Like there's so many things and it's so powerful to hear you say this because I know that um, on a different level, I've been saying this for ages and I actually get criticized by the people around me because they're like, oh, you're crazy, you know? Um, and I'm like, I'm like, no, oh, yeah, don't. you're out on a farm. <laughs> yeah. You're actually like, doing it. Right? I, I'm doing my best. Like, and you know, it is so much work. I cannot tell you how much work it is to have this big garden and all these animals and work like a crazy person and do all these things. And, and, and the thing is, is when I think of removing that particular stressor from my life, I'm like, no, I'm teaching my kids how food is raised. Even if it's on a small scale, we know what it's like. I mean, and I've been criticized for butchering our own animals at times or whatever. I mean, we're going to go buy a cow, another cow here in a couple months. Like um, I've been criticized for these things, but the thing is, is this is the, the circle of life. And I, when I think of taking that away from yeah. my kids, I think of they're not, they're not communicating with an iPad or a computer or a TV. They're communi communicating with a living, breathing thing. They're, they're seeing how it, it functions and what it eats and what it does. And when they're riding our horses, they're seeing that they have to communicate that way. And like, there's just so many powerful things about it that 
when I think of making my life simple and being like, oh, living in a high rise apartment, that would be easy. There's no lawn, there's no this. I'm like, what am I thinking? I couldn't think something like that because I'm trying to keep some part of nature alive in my kids' lives. Well, then not only are you trying, you are succeeding because what that level of education is doing is a level of education I didn't have. I grew up a city kid in, in Detroit. Um, I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not some salt of the earth person by any means. Um, they're, it's uncomfortable, right? Being of the earth and look, learning to toil and work in harmony with, you are not in control. Humans don't like one to know that. Like they want to, we want to, our, our brains have given us the capacity to exert extreme control through force and domination of our environment. We can artificially subjugate temperature, you know, uh, weather really. I mean, we can do all of it. We can make it be winter when it's summer and summer when it's winter, right inside our houses with our clothing, with, you know, artificial things that we can do. That's an extreme aberration of information to the human physiology, however. So your kids are getting an education that teaches like what actually goes into um, what are we made of and how do we get it? It's actually stunning to think that some children don't know where milk come from, comes from. They think it's from a carton in a grocery store, you know? <laughs> and now even worse, it just gets delivered to your house on Amazon. Like the brown guy in the truck, the UPS brown truck comes and there's food. And like, there's no connection of what's actually going on. In addition, your kids are getting an education from the, the biome, from the microbiome and the virome, all the bugs and things that they get to encounter is educating their system that unfortunately city children do not get. It's, an, it's a travesty that is growing up in the cities. At least when I, I was in the 70s, I'm, I'm 48 this month. So we did go out in, in, into places and, and see barn animals and everybody had a lot of animals and stuff. We weren't overly hygienic. We weren't disinfecting like crazy. So I had a lot more exposure as a child than kids do today. So you're doing, that's an incredible education, not only an intellectual education, but uh, the bug education, what they're ingesting, you know, you know, I hope you realize what you're doing to their immune system, what you're doing to their neurology, you're lowering their, uh, their risk of ever getting PTSD and handling how they handle trauma. So the choice to face discomfort creates resiliency. And I think that's, again, part of the weakening and destruction of humanity that has been systematically done with, to people like me through a lot of education, right? Eight years of, of college, doctorate degree and stuff. And we get taught intellectualism, like how disgusting nature is. Like we're taught that it's disgusting, right? To the point, I was 14 years a vegetarian. So that's, that's the, and a vegan, 12 years. So that is the ultimate inversion of what is natural, right? You're able, they're able to take information and pervert it so deeply that I looked at somebody like you, let's say, who hunted or butchered their own animals and thought, that's disgusting. What type of vile, this is, these are the thoughts, right? And they were all just tell the truth, what a vegan thinks. What a vile and disgusting evil person that is, that they could kill something. Right. And if that doesn't tell you the story of how disconnected you are to your own primal nature and what it is to me human, I don't know what does. And the more I see this now, I actually just reached out to a few women and maybe I'll, you'll be a part of the series. You know, do you hunt? Oh yeah. Big see, I don't, I never have. Okay. Yeah. So again, I get, I always categorize myself. I'm a recovering vegan. Yeah. So like I have to, it's to touch. It took a long time before I could put my hands on raw meat, right? Even mm -hmm. though I've been eating it for like 16 years again, and I'm carnivore over two years. It's still sometimes like, mm, yeah, I don't need it that bloody though. I can't, you know, like I can't handle it. Um, but on uh, interviewing women who hunt, and it's a, it's a really fascinating thing because those of you who do in the keto carnivore community and will post it, I've seen uh, take horrific bashing and the hypocritical nature of that is repulsive to me at this point because people will drive through a McDonald's without thinking about it for a second. Yet you're disgusting because you went out and and had a, a really. I'm stunned at the sacred, like kind of spiritual aspect, and actually what I understand of people like me go off 
to some little city park or whatever. And we say, oh, I'm going hiking and I'm getting connected to nature in my Lululemon $8,000 yoga pants. Okay. With my Starbucks, you know, <laughs> plastic bottle in hand and with that moldy, disgusting coffee that's going to kill you. And we think I'm ooh kumbaya because I meditated by a waterfall. I'm so connected to nature versus the hunter goes out and spends four days blending into nature in such a way that they breathe in rhythm with nature to the point birds will land upon them. And they know that if they are gifted with a turkey or a deer walking before them that they're able to get, then that's a gift from the divine to feed their family that they've been given and they're grateful for it. And they do all of the work required, all the repugnantness that's required because you can't escape the pain that went into that life that was sacrificed for you. Mm -hmm. Yet that's all of us. We get to do that by just going off into our little hikes and our little kumbaya moments and having our little fake burger beyond me. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's the delusional thinking that I was trapped in blows my mind now when I look at it. And so I am really work very hard to have deep compassion because I was in a delusional state for a very long time. I was brainwashed as well, completely disconnected. So I don't bring any judgment to him like, oh yeah, I know what that's like. Yeah. I get that they believe that. And again, to me, that's part of the systematic ploy to weaken humanity. Because you want to weaken somebody, you give them, you take away their animal-based uh, protein and fat, and you give them a bunch of soy-based fake chemical processed manufactured things that are ruining the environment, ruining the body. You're making their brain smaller. You're making their the muscles disappear. Your bones are weak. They're, you know, they're collapse. We're collapsing as, as a species. And that riddles everybody to have a very fertile ground for tremendous uh, mental health issues, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. I mean, it's more and more prevalent. Like out of my clients that I see, I would say nine out of 10 of them come to me and they say, oh yeah, I'm taking antidepressants. And it's like, why? <laughs> like why? And I start diving into that because I find that a lot of times, once you like cha start changing all these outside influences that are negatively affecting their rhythm, like that, that flow they are supposed to have and that vibe, things start to change. So, um, mm -hmm. and everything you just said right there, um, was, was really true and connected. I mean, like when, when we go to like shoot an elk, we just shot a big elk this fall, seven and a half miles out in the middle of nowhere. And it took us multiple trips to get it out. And it was a lot of work, like so much work that I could hardly walk the next day. And I'm a dang athlete, you know, like I was like, I, and I, it had me thinking like, how do some people do this? Because I know not everybody is in the same kind of shape as me. And it, you know, but it requires it, skill. Yeah. And there it was a skill, right? definitely yeah. something spiritual about it. I mean, honestly, like we were, my husband and I are both, we were like kind of sad about the big bull elk we killed. But on the other hand, we, we told him, Hey, thanks buddy. Give him a pet. You know, you're going to feed our family for the rest of this year. And, yeah. you know, to some people that might be horrific, but that's, that's nature. And that's the way things were intended to be. And we're eating the most pure, clean meat for our family that's available. So it hasn't been impacted by all of these outside influences. No, it's, it's tremendous. And like I said, and that's an interesting thing. Like, again, I was able to alter my private logic around it as a vegan for a long time with, you know, I did it all for spiritual reasons really. And then I just used the health propaganda, right? Which is a total farce that it's healthy for you, but um, to kind of back it up. And what you just said, like say, some people would think it's horrific and you go, but yeah, but why? Because that's what every human being on every, uh, and on this planet has been doing for hundreds of thousands of years. And every sacred kind of tribal indigenous culture that we say we praise, right? That everybody looks to, oh, the Aboriginal group or the Maasai or the Native Americans, or, you know, like they were so spirit, you know, spiritual and people go off and do sweat lodges and, you know, white people trying to do the Indian things is what I'm saying. Like, you know, some I'm, I'm East Indian. So people go to Tibet and they try to borrow what they're doing here and they try to borrow here. But if you look at any of these primal cultures, they all hunted, ate primarily, you know, meat-based diets. There was not a single vegetarian society ever on earth until religion was created, until these Western religions. And it was all that same sacred. They understood the transmutation of the spirit energy of the life cycle and what was happening when they ate that. And it was with like this reverence and 
honor there of course there's sadness but it's this reverence and this honor and this gratitude that's like this is this is what has to happen and i understood that again for myself when i got very sick as a vegan and i had to make that moment with tears and crying and looking in a mirror basically talking to god going am i really going to have to do this to stay alive and i thought it was i was being brainwashed to think that that i should feel shame or guilt for something that was naturally primally human that's what's happening to us right you you you're in a world where you're combating oh it's a lot of work it's a lot of work to farm it's a lot of work to hunt it's a lot, but but because i could just press a button and make my life easier it could just you know we have hot water right the fact that i can i'm always i'm often astounded i can go into a shower and go look hot water that's a miracle because that doesn't happen everywhere in the world by the way mm -hmm. right you know, if you've ever traveled and not had hot water, you'll appreciate when you finally get a hot shower again. And knowing you can choose comfort so easily, you know, Connie, it does take a certain amount of character to say, I'm not going to always make that easy choice because my system deserves me to put itself under that stress because all of life and growth is stress recovery, stress recovery, stress recovery, right? And as a mm -hmm. fitness expert, mm -hmm. you know that. The, all healing happens when we stress a system and rest it so it can recover. Stress it, give it enough rest and let it recover. And then you, then it's just, you constantly keep, you know, getting gains. And I'm sure you've seen with your clients, if you're in the gym with them, if they don't stress hard enough, they're not going to get gains or they don't rest hard enough. They're not mm -hmm. going to get gains because you can overdo it either way. And so it's that beautiful flow and balance. So you got to go through like some discomfort and you got to let yourself recover from it. Mm -hmm. um, but I think our, as a culture, we've been trained, you should avoid discomfort at, at all costs. Like it, discomfort is should never be in your life. So like, just, just buy more stuff and get more shoes and eat more stuff and just lay around because that's fine. And nowadays you can be 500 pounds and that's actually healthy. You know what I mean? Like there's yeah. a totally <laughs> different, yeah, a different mindset on yeah. Yeah. And heaven forbid you tell somebody that is obese that they do need to lose some weight because then you're shaming them when unfortunately in, in this process of trying to not hurt people's feelings, people are growing larger and larger. I know we went to um, a hot spring a couple of weeks ago and I would wager to say 90% of the people that were there were morbidly obese or super obese. And the children too. And that's one yeah. thing that really bothers me is seeing kids um, that are overweight. And I can tell you nine out of 10 of them were, and I was just like, this is so sad. And I'm watching them down these pizzas and pretzels with cheese and all these things. And, and it would just made me sad because many of these people don't even know what they're doing. They don't know. That's the reality. They're well, they're following the USDA guidelines and According to those guidelines, pizza is a vegetable because it has tomato sauce, right? French fries are a vegetable to a school lunch program. Pizza counts as a vegetable. Um, they've dropped all their protein requirements. They're absurdly low now. So, and they put protein in the same category. They'll say protein from broccoli and quinoa is, is the same caliber as a steak or liver, which is complete and utter nonsense. You know, they just know, they don't know how to look at bioavailability. They look at fat, just as fat. They don't look at it and say, okay, healthy, you know, beautiful, lovely saturated fat and cholesterol that heals a brain versus the polyunsaturated fatty acid PUFAs that are in disgusting seed oils like soybean oil and corn oil and canola oil. It's all the same to them. And in fact, the good fat is what they call the devil demon fat, right? Mm -hmm. So they're all their, their recommendations and guidelines are designed to destroy human beings. Mm -hmm. So I don't, you know what I mean? Like I, I, I struggle with this because I'm like, again, oh, people should know better. Should they know better? Because they want, if they watch TV or listen to the news or listen to a Sanjay Gupta or a Fauci or something like this, what? I mean, I'm supposed to eat, you know, soybean. Uh, that's not bad. Soybean, this is the healthy oil, isn't it? And I'm not supposed to eat red meat because that'll kill you. Carcinogenic. I mean, it's, just, it's very carcinogenic. Yeah, red meat it's is. just a lie after a lie after a lie. 
and they don't understand that the FDA, the CDC, the World Health Organization, they're all corrupt. They're all bought and paid for by the big pharma cartel. And all they care about is making you a chronically ill customer for life. Mm-hmm. They, they really don't get it. And I think it's just because of the beautiful, naive nature of human beings to be so empathic and so compassionate. So we therefore trust other people and organizations because we really don't have a, a, a seed core of evil within us. So we don't assume other people are doing that to us. So I think that's part of, I've, I've gained more compassion for myself and humanity when I'm like, oh man, it's just because we're so empathic and compassionate. We just can't fathom that they really are that full of shit. And they're really trying to actually hurt us. And I think we need to start saying it that blatantly at this point. I don't think that they're misguided. I think they're downright corrupt and evil now because there's too many things happening in the school system, in the food system, in the drug system, in the healthcare system uh, to make it all kind of converge that people that live in certain socioeconomic classes in certain areas of the earth are screwed because their school sucks, their food sucks, their water sucks. I mean, I'm from Michigan. Look at Flint, Michigan and the lead in the water. I mean, these kids for generations are ruined. The IQs are going to be lower. How are they ever going to get themselves out of that? You have, you're gonna have generations of lead poisoning brain damage with lower IQ, lower cognitive, cognitive ability, much higher mental illnesses, chronic illnesses. How are they supposed to pull themselves out of that? that that's, that's, a, that's a crisis in that, in that city. Right. Mm -hmm. So, and that's going on in 15 other municipalities in the United States of America have those same levels, by the way, that's going on all over the place. So the poison and the food, like you said, the air, the water, it is overwhelming to people to like, well, what do I do? What do I do? And for me, I always just try to bring it back. Let's go back to what does it mean to be human? And if you have no idea, look at humans 40,000 years ago. Believe it or not, we still kind of have some of those tribes on the planet. <laughs> you know, we actually know a lot. And we have some books from people, from explorers from a couple hundred years ago, where they would go off into these remote faint areas. And what did they do? Do they brush their teeth? No. Do they drink fluoride water? No. Do they have cavities? No. Do they have cancer? No. Do they talk on cell phones? No. Do they watch TV? No. <laughs> you know what I mean? Do they sit? Most of them never sit. They squat and stand and lie down. Like we know all kinds of things about how do they move? How do they breathe? How do they, you know, do they breastfeed their children or do they give them something out of, out of a can? No, they, they all breastfeed. Might be something to that, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? So we have the information, but if, if people don't ever learn to question the authority, And then that, um, you know, that white coat syndrome they have with doctors, it's a problem that that they just think, well, they know better, they know better. And I think because of things like social media, which has its big downsides, but it's made access to information and dissenting voices much easier for people to, to people like my mother at 75, right, to find things, bits and pieces. Wait a minute, I, but there's the other doctor, they, they said what you said, honey, like that, I should be eating more red meat. I'm like, I know mom, see, because <laughs> you have to contrast it with what her dietitian is telling her mm-hmm. because to them, it, you got to go low fat, have all these carbs. And I'm like, oh, this is, this is why you got diabetes mom. And I could make it go away <laughs> if you could listen, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But it's like, oh, but the doctor said, oh, but the doctor said, yeah. I'm like, you know, it's malpractice if I start giving people advice on mm, cardiac valve replacements, because I'm not trained in that. I don't know anything about it. So I don't give advice in that. That's, I could be sued, right? So I don't understand physicians giving advice on nutrition or food when they know nothing about it mm-hmm. and they don't study it. And when they say asinine things like what you eat doesn't matter or everything in moderation, I'm like, okay. I, I, I can't give that advice. I don't understand how they're legally able to do that because it you should know. be malpractice, right? And I explain that to so many people, right? They're like, oh, well, my doctor said, and I'm like, your doctor never was trained in this. And the doctors that, that went to school, there are so many doctors out there that you and I both swim in the same circle with that went to school and they say they are now changed men. They learned to, t- they changed their whole way of thinking. And they're like, 
I never even, I'm looking back at it. I never even had an education on this. And then I was telling people how to get healthy when I wasn't even healthy myself. No, so. most physicians look horrible. I mean, I, we were, I was taught, you know, primal ways of eating 25 years ago in, in chiropractic school. So that's, we're, we're in a very different, you know, we're the quacks and then the, the weirdos, right? But Ayurvedic medicine, Chinese medical doctors, chiropractors, homeopaths, you know, again, you might have very different angles on things, but if they were ever taught any primal ancestral ways of studying and not dogma that's religious based, because that comes up a lot, unfortunately, like the US dietary recommendations are the Seventh-day Adventist church. I mean, they're very religious and that's a vegetarian religion. So it's, it pushes that into the diet. And then I don't know, not everybody knows that, right? Because he mm-hmm. was time to study it. And it's just bought and paid for by Kellogg and you just, a lot of money goes into stuff and oh yeah. And they can put commercials and you know, whatever, but anybody who ends up studying those things and just go, well, just these basic primal ways of being like, sometimes people say, I don't, you know what I mean? Like I tell people like, look, so if we're, if you're watching, you're not listening, I'm holding up a phone. There's nothing natural about this iPhone. Right. And the reality of when you start telling people, let me explain to you how your body oscillates the frequencies and rhythms that the human system does, and then the frequencies that this does. And if you bring that, everybody understands an x-ray machine can kill you, right? So sometimes I have to start telling them when we start talking about, let's just look at how you're bombarded with unnatural things. And it's why, and these things are not your choice. You, you, you didn't control the satellites that went into space. You didn't control the DDT that was sprayed in the environment. You don't control the glyphosate that's been sprayed on, on all the food. You, you know, you aren't controlling a, a lot of this. I get it. But it is why you need to up your game with what you put in your mouth, what you put in your ears, what you put on your skin, right? What you put in your home, um, which you, you put in your eyes, even like to me, the diet is everything I read, everything I see, everything I hear. It's the music, it's the TV, you know, it's the movies, um, everything because you're absorbing it. You know, you're a sensory information being. So if it's getting, knowing that you're going to have to take some steps and to believe it or not, like I'm sure you teach your clients, it's actually not that hard, even though I can lay out like all the ways you're being destroyed. But if you just go back to the basics of what does it mean to be human? Let's talk about air. How do we breathe? How do we sleep? How do we move? How do we eat? How do we drink? As humans that are connected to nature, the answers become really basic and really clear. And it's not that complicated. And you don't need 18,000 therapies and 47 supplements. You just don't. Because like you said, what you were saying before, I forget how you said it, but like to me, you were saying the human body has a divine right to be healthy. And it's like everything that's coming in and blocking it. And, and that those are the light bulbs. Those are the, the electricity in your house. That's, you know, it's all of this stuff that we've done. And yes, I like comfort and I like my air conditioning and my heating, but do I do things to counteract the damage that's doing to my system? Yes, I do. The problem is most people don't even realize that's damaging their systems. Mm-hmm. Right. So let's dissect that because you have found modalities to help improve a lot of these things. And your main focus is mental health right now. So can you tell us how all of these things, especially the frequencies that were around and stuff? Cause I, you know, a lot of people don't realize, like you said, when you held up the phone that, that we're running on a frequency ourselves. So, so can you kind of dive into what you're doing and how all of these things are affecting us? and, and our yeah. mental state. I'll, I'll do it as fast as I can because, um, everything is all together, right? To me, everything's a great whole. i see, I don't know how to really see fractionated parts. So when I give like a patient report, it can be usually 15 to 20 pages and it can be overwhelming, but I'm like, yeah, but I got to explain the whole thing to you <laughs> because you're a, you're a quantum biological living system. It's a, it's a dynamic system. It's not parts. It's, it's the total opposite of medicine. It's, it, which is a mechanistic, break it all apart and go see this doctor, that doctor, 47 doctors to do every little thing and nobody knows what's actually going on. No one's actually running the thing. You know, you're not an engine that can be broken. The carburetors here and the sp- part, spark plugs, it's not how a human works, okay? A living system, a vitalistic system, a dog, a, anything, anything that's biologically alive, right? So I look at the human system, you are 
This is real and recorded. It is not woo-woo. You are a light frequency being. So you have sound waves and light waves. They form together. They, they have like a transmutation of what happens to, to generate through matter. So we have, I, I measure on patients sound. I look at light. I, and therefore that also creates electricity. We are electrical. And that creates, whenever you have electricity that runs straight through something, it, that creates a magnetic pulse. So that's why we say we're electromagnetic. Um, and there's different ways that this is created. We are electrical before we are chemical. Medicine is obsessed with chemistry. All drugs are chemicals. Electricity is the foundation of who we are though. And the chemicals come up much later, neurotransmitters and hormones and things like that. But it's based on the, how, the, how much electrical charge we have and how much electromagnetic pulse we can create. So that's just an overview. Now I'm not gonna, you know, we have these little things like mito called mitochondria that are inside of us, these little bugs that live in our cells. They run electricity through them, basically, let's say that's dropped off. Electricity, electrons only move on a photon of light. So you basically have light bundles <laughs> that drop off electricity, make a bunch of energy and create this puff of a pulse. Well, this electromagnetic pulse, we have more mitochondria in our brain than anywhere, a second then is our, our heart. And so we get these huge recorded pulsations we can we can measure from a human body go wow look at what's coming off of them well they're coming from these little things that are everywhere except everywhere in your body basically blood cells well overall what those pulse the electricity does i measure it in the brain with a qeg so eegs are measuring electro electrical activity of the brain ekgs measure them of the heart so if you, anybody questions are we electromagnetic yeah we are mris work because we're magnetic um so when you measure our brain there's different the brain waves run to give you an idea we have these um delta theta alpha smr beta uh gamma okay just the words, but give you an idea the frequencies are one to four frequency, four to eight, eight to 12, 12 to 15, 15 to 20, right? They're not high. So see low, give you an idea. The earth resonance is roughly, you know, we can look at the planet or the Schumann resonance. So in the seven to nine, six, right? Just low, just think of it like that. Okay. So in general, the brain is in this 30, you know, 20, 30 hertz, earth, 10, 7, 10, let's say the ionosphere, the way they're combined, the human whole system, roughly 30 to 40 hertz. These electrons, so all the electricity that runs in an American home, 60 hertz. Just, just to show you like how different that is, right, from where we, when I sleep at night, I should be getting into two, three, four hertz. That's what I need to be. I, you know, we oscillate between like two and eight hertz. Like that's that's the brain. That's how slow it wants to move. Well, if I have th this, I, I can't even remember the like gigahertz. Like it's the 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 billions and millions of how many hertz. If I'm sleeping in my bedroom and I've got all these gadgets plugged in, this thing on my nightstand, this far away from my head. 60 Hertz pumped in all around my house, a smart meter on my house. They're giving off, you know, thousands of times the Hertz watch, you know, millions, it, it, megas and gigas. Those are like beyond stupid numbers of 10 to the <laughs> some power. Like it's so many zeros. All of those devices around us, as well as all the devices on my street, all the street lights, the 5G networks, the 3G, the 4G, the 5G, right? The satellites, they're bombarding me with radio waves, microwaves, various electromagnetic frequencies. We call them are non-native. They're not native to the earth. We artificially made them. And they're bombarding me to run thousands, if not tens to thousands, if not sometimes millions of rates faster than I'm designed to run. So it's like trying to run a car in 20th gear when it only has five. Something's going to break eventually on that engine, correct? Because it cannot keep up with that. The oil's gonna, it's just gonna, things are gonna break. That is what is happening to all of us, especially vulnerable children 
at that mitochondrial level, these little things, they're, they are sensors. What these little bugs are in the cells are actually electromagnetic sensors. They're antennas to gather electrical magnetic information from your environment to tell you where to go and what to do. That's what they do. Well, we're basically short circuiting, over plugging, exploding all the circuits of the mitochondria. They're becoming completely de deranged. When they fail, we die. We get very sick and die. Um, if you, I think it's cyanide. It's either cyanide or I think it's cyanide. I, oh, I always get it wrong. But that's, there's one of those poisons that kills you right away. It's because it shuts down all your mitochondria. You'll die in a couple of minutes when they all shut down. So if we're supposed to be, if when I'm going to bed, my brain is supposed to go into a state of like, you know, I need it to, it goes up and down in stages. Let me just say five, six Hertz, right? That's low, <laughs> but I'm being bombarded in a sea that's trying to put me at 60 Hertz, 80 Hertz, hundred Hertz, 300 Hertz. Do you have a sleep disorder or do you have an electrification of altering your frequencies artificially from outside forces? You, you, you see what I mean? So this is why sometimes I'm like, the answer isn't that you need more L-theanine and GABA. It, you know, yeah, we need darkness so you can make melatonin, but we also need to look at your environment and get all of this crap out of at least your bedroom. Turn your Wi-Fi off at night. Stop the bombarding of the poison a little bit that you can do in your environment. And there's, there's all kinds of, you can go from spending almost no money to just turning everything off, right? To spending a lot of money putting in, you know, radio shielding on your windows and Faraday cages and all kinds of stuff. And some people have to do that because there is a real illness, electromagnetic sensitivity that they can, it shuts, it basically causes all of those electromagnetic satellites in the body to start oscillating at the wrong frequencies and get disordered information and they can't handle it. So that's one way, right? So just, if it's doing that to sleep, what is it doing with anxiety? What is it doing with all, so, cause all anxiety is, is kind of a brain that's running way too fast. It's stuck in the wrong gear. It gets stuck in this high beta, which is awesome for thinking and problem solving. But if you can't turn that off and drop into alpha and then theta to go to bed, that's a sleep disorder. Or it's also chronic anxiety because you're always sped up too fast. Right. So does that make sense in terms of trying to explain it biologically? Like we have frequencies and we're designed to go up and down throughout the day to meet the need. I should, be, when I meditate, I drop into one frequency. If a crisis happens, I'm going to rev up really, really fast into another frequency so I can think outside of myself and solve a problem. Then when I'm done with that, I should be able to go right back, get inside myself and get quiet. Daydreaming is a certain frequency, for instance, right? So different emotions come from these different frequencies, different chemicals are made in these frequencies. So if you can't go into Delta enough, you don't make enough growth hormone. It, it, that, that this is really how it works. So if we know, well, they make too much, everybody who's in a coma has way too many Delta waves. Shocker. You know what I mean? Like we know we can measure the brainwave state and then we teach people how to control them themselves. So therefore they can change their neurochemistry. They can change their mood. They can change their performance. Um, that is in well, that's one way there, I, but I teach everybody tons of gadgets and I have a bunch of gadgets to help counteract technology. So basically technology has this, you know, two edges of the sword, right? I'm like, well, it can really, it's caused some problems, but thankfully we know how to use it to fix some problems. So it's about leveraging my practice and what I do is leveraging what does it mean to be human? How do we stay human? I'm very opposed to like the artificial intelligent movement and implanting things. And I, I, I don't want people to become bionic by putting microchips in their brain. I, I'm not a fan. Okay. So, and there's a lot of people in my field that actually are for this. Like, won't this be great? We can access 500 years. And I'm like, um, no, <laughs> you know, like this, this is not going well. I don't want a bunch of cyborgs running around the planet. Right. So, but looking at those primal ways and saying, well, this is where we are. This is the world we're in. So what are the technologies that are, are here to counteract? You know, like how can we, you can take free energy and you can light up the planet or off, have clean water, or you can create a destructive weapon with it. Right. So it's like, what do you, what are we going to do with the technologies we have? So, um, 
Yeah, frequencies matter. And I tell if there's a one thing I like people to do, we we address the frequencies in their home right away. We do frequencies like with this, like it cannot be near your body. Do not put it in your pockets. Keep it as far away from you as possible. My children should never be touching, looking at these things. They should be nowhere near a child's brain. This penetrates my skull, no problem, but they, their skulls aren't even formed. So there's a lot that people don't know. Even the American Pediatric Association, which are horrible, they, they know no child should be looking at a screen or touching until they're three. Do you think your pediatrician tells anybody that? No, because everywhere you go, you see babies holding those things up. And every time I do that, I like, I feel like 14 fairies around the world have just died and a sorrow of weeping into my heart goes on. And I can't walk up to them and say, please, please. Like, I feel like they're giving their child a cigarette in front of me. It's horrible. I'd say the only great part about a, a, a child that age holding a phone is at least they're probably getting some form of bacteria that they wouldn't get otherwise. <laughs> That's awesome. I'm thinking from like my kids play the the chicken coop with with no shoes on, right? And people think it's gross. My daughter's out there in her bathing suit and she's playing with chickens. And I'm like, sweet, she's getting to where she's she's got a good immune system. Cool. And uh so I mean that's the only other thing I can do. You know what you're gonna be able to do? (laughs) No, you know what you're gonna be able to do? You're going to be able to sell your kids poops for fecal transplants. Well, no <laughs> kidding. Nobody's I mean, going to have a flora I, like your kid. I mean, seriously, though, there are I'm tribes serious. out there where they they want to study their poop because it's so perfect. And yeah. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, I'm working on that right now. Like people are like, I, I had a meal prep class the other day at my house and I had my farm fresh eggs there. And one of them still had a stain on it. Like I washed it off, but it had a poop stain on it and I cracked it into the bowl and the lady was like mortified. (laughs) And I was like, "Eh." I mean, I've never died. (laughs) And, and, And these are the same people that will have like a diet Coke Mm -hmm. and they won't think twice about it. It's like they, they'll have aspartame, NutraSweet, sucralose, like it's no big deal because that's approved by the FDA, but your chicken shell, that's going to be the thing to undo that. You know what I mean? It, that's what I'm saying. The, this sanita- this unnatural, you know, human way of living, I think a big part of it is over sanitation, which is something I'm, you know, been looking at for a while. Like the sanitization of life is how, why, why we think hunting is repulsive you know, nobody looks at birth anymore. Nobody looks at death anymore. We've sanitized the, the, the parts of life that we don't want to well beyond when, you know, the Western Christians came in and said, oh, brown rice is bad. Bleach everything. Like any, everything needs to be, everything brown, we must make whiter, right? So they did it with the food. They did it with the people. They did that. We're going to whitewash everything. Um, and so it's like sanitizing, you know, it's like they clearly have like a compulsive disorder around germs and everything needs to be clean mm-hmm. um, to, to that with that eye that pers- one perspective of human uh, culture likes and that's what's going on so now it's like birth becomes a dirty thing nobody should be around for there oh we gotta take her away in a room and nobody sees it versus how it always was before the kids are there and everyone's watching everything and it mm-hmm. is what it is and it's a, it is a dirty messy procedure we've both been through it right yeah, yeah. um you know, death can be very dirty and messy. And people used to, I haven't had the honor of um, being with someone right when they leave, but everybody I've ever spoken to, especially if it was one of their parents, um, talks of it in such a beautiful moment. They, They know like there was this moment and it like everything about it they say it was, they're so grateful to be in that moment. They can, they never can describe it. They mm-hmm. just say it was like one of the most spiritual, sacred moments of their lives to, to be witness to that, to have that experience. Um, and that's something we've sanitized away, right? Because we keep separating people from having these experiences. Like, mm-hmm. and unless you're doing a home birth and your kids are all, all up in there, they aren't getting that experience. Unless your family's there and you let them die at home with the family around them, you don't get that experience. Mm-hmm. And you don't see what your kids are seeing in terms of all of it. Cause it's not just the animals that you're raising that are providing in a part of the community and then do a transmutation of life force. It's the humans as well. 
mm-hmm. right? It's we we come and we go, mm-hmm. and we've become you know we it's death and even birth has become such a perversion that as if it's a dirty thing we shouldn't know about and we're gonna fight no matter what we're, we'll do any obscene monstrosity to avoid almost right the messiness of it or whatever so it's really really interesting um and technology plays into that mm-hmm. and comfort right the desire to use technology to stay comfortable so we can stay unaware and keep our heads in the sand as if real things don't happen right yeah. and it's just led to us being a very hypocritical kind of delusional group of people but i still believe in humans <laughs> I, still, I still like us but it's that to me is one of the biggest things ultimately of where a lot of the health issues and the mental health issues come from mm-hmm. it's just this connection and living breaking the laws of nature and it just comes that people aren't taught the laws of nature anymore because they're never allowed, like your kids are being allowed to be in nature, to observe nature. The best way to learn the laws of nature are to observe and experience. Mm-hmm. And you, like you said, you can't do that holding a screen. You can't do that behind a computer. You don't do that watching a documentary about it. Mm-hmm. You have to go out and be in it and exchange energy with it. Mm-hmm. You know, they're exchanging bugs with the environment with the chickens with the dogs with the, like they're they're communicating with each other that way they're creating a symbiotic relationship and they're making each other stronger you know and that's people just haven't been taught that yeah and it's unfortunate because i i know that it's some of the best times of our i mean every other weekend in the summertime we spend in the middle of nowhere like checked yeah. out no electronics and here's the other thing you're talking about vibration we sleep incredible in nature. <laughs> There's nothing well, interrupting it. Right. Well, and why? The earth is in training you to the low frequencies of sleep. Mm-hmm. Just like every animal that you go out there that, you know, they sleep on the ground. They know where to go to in the ground. They have special places they like because the frequency there is better. There's, mm-hmm. these, there's the earth has its own grid where certain parts are stronger and the forces are better. So they like that spot. Like why does the cat always go there? Because mm-hmm. it's getting a lot of frequency. It's getting a lot of electromagnetic healing. It's getting free electrons. It's getting an- antioxidants from the earth. The earth heals you. It is nut- the sun gives you food. The sun is food. We are like plants. People don't. That's another lie that they don't get taught. You know, like yeah, we do convert sunlight into energy. You guys, like if you get a lot of sunlight, you aren't as hungry because you don't need it. It's giving you electrons, right? So yeah, you sleep incredibly well because all of that electromagnetic noise, it's, it's, it's a frequency pollution that is literally altering your physiological function. It's, I think it's, it, it's definitely altering anatomical. I know it's, it's altering the mitochondria uh, anatomy. It's, it those changes their shape and therefore function and your brain frequency patterns. It alters how you can think. It alters how you, if you can calm yourself down, if you can go to sleep. Well, I mean, if that isn't, it's a primary root cause of, of, of our mental health crisis to me. And it's one of those things that doesn't get talked about. So I do what I can to teach my patients and, and uh, courses, anything else about ways they can alter their environment in their home and do things like, and, and then encourage now that you've done it, can you, can you go camping? Can you go to the, like, like, again, I'm not a nature like lover. My son is a survivalist. And so spirit brought me a boy that somehow was divinely knows it's about outside. And we, everything, so I was forced into learning how to camp. I'm forced into buying some, like, we're going to go to axe throwing class because this kid, he's a survivalist. He can eat bark. He can do all kinds of stuff. Uh, and he told me around eh, 11 or 12, he said, mom, I just, I know you think it's crazy that I'm into all this stuff. I said, actually, honey, I don't think it's remotely crazy. Let me be real clear. I think you're being divinely told information to flow down to me, to speak to me. So I'm going to get all this prep stuff you're telling me to get. What do I need to learn? And so I'm like, I don't, mommy really doesn't know how to start a fire, but let's figure it out. Right? Like he knows, but he's just driven. He said, I just want to be the kind of man that can take one bag on the, my back and survive for a year in the woods. I want to be able to do that. And I was like, well, that's a hell of a goal. See, there's nothing soft or weak about that, right? No, like he knows, there's a lot of skills you've got to learn. And so the next one, like I told you, like we don't hunt, 
and nobody in my family, it's not a thing, and, but I'm, I would always say, well, if he wants to know how to fish, I'll go find somebody who knows and I got to hire them. You know what I mean? I, he needs to know somebody how to, I'm going to find a guy that knows the berries and the food and the, I'm going to find, you know, so I have the hunting group now. And I said, okay. And he's like, mom, I don't want to actually kill an animal at all. I, but I need to know how to do this so I can take care of myself and I can take care of whoever needs me to take care of them. And I want to be that kind of man. And I was like, you know what, honey, that's the kind of man we need. I'm going to make sure you are going to become that kind of man. And we have those conversations. And I say, this is what matters. You need to have a sound brain and a sound body. You need to be, you know, neurologically, psychologically, and physiologically strong, capable, and ready. I need you to be fit enough in every way capable that if there is a fire, you know you can run into that fire, save who need, because because when you're competent, you get courage from that. That's mm -hmm. what it is. And so we're often out places and we would, when he was really young, we would play the game. I said, so who in here do you think could do anything if something were to happen? He's like, what do you mean? I said, look around. And he would point, and I said, well, and I said, yeah, it's your responsibility to stay strong. It's your responsibility to stay fit. I said, because one day you will be bigger than me. You will be stronger than me. And I expect you to be the kind of man in the room that will stand up and do what's right because you're capable and you will not cower in the face of something that's dangerous. And I go, you got to start working on that young. Mm -hmm. And it was an odd thing for me as a, as a single mom to realize going from being a vegan, like, oh, I'm never going to kill any, like, oh my God, kumbaya. And I'm just so utopian to saying, oh, right. I'm raising a man. Huh. I got to rethink that. And it was my, one of my mentors who was a man. I was like, Stephanie, you got to rethink this. We got to talk about it. He, you need to just tell the truth more and there is violence in the world and he knows that and he wants to protect you. And he's getting, my son was getting really anxious and always afraid someone was going to break in the house mm -hmm. and hurt us young, real young. And I was like, where is this coming from? I think again, it was just messages from spirit to say, I'm going to need you, Stephanie, to, to stop being like this and get back to nature. I'm going to force you into nature. I'm going to force you for your son. So then I didn't dislike it, you know, kind of like you, like, oh, I really hate it, but my kids need it. You know, like, it really sucks with it's good for the kid, right? So like, it doesn't feel so cold and awful on the tent or if it's raining, because you're with me, you're like, yeah, my baby loves this. So mm -hmm. I'm good because he's good. And this sucks. I'd rather be at the Ritz getting a massage, but like, <laughs> right? You know what I mean? So now I like it from a different perspective because I see these spiritual and neurological benefits. Mm -hmm. Like I get it from a different way. Like children need to be out in nature. They should not be in these classrooms. They should be learning everything from the earth. And I had professors telling me that, but I didn't really understand it. And I was like, oh yeah, now I get it. So I'm learning, trying, you know, kind of someone said, yeah, I gotta learn more of this homesteading stuff. I, you know, I gotta learn more of what you're doing. And it, it, it's an uncomfortable proposition. Mm -hmm. And it really is about mindset and what I think I'm like, what do I really want for my life though? For now and you know, do I want to be weak and dependent? And if things systems break down, I don't know what to do. If there's no water, I don't know how to survive. If there's no grocery stores, I'm gonna starve. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Right? Because that's not what humans used to say. They'd be like, Oh, okay, big storm's coming in. I guess we should adapt. I mm -hmm. guess we should move. Oh, the animals are leaving. I guess we should pack up our crap and follow the food. Yeah. I mean, you know, they just knew what to do. And they've been, we've been surviving millions of years doing that. Now it's like YouTube goes down and we don't, Netflix is offline and oh, it's a crisis. Yeah. Like people think Netflix going down is the end of the world. Right? Yep. That's, that's pretty how, crazy. That's how food, you know, spoon fed we've become. And so it's about, you know, for me, teaching them to interject a little bit of discomfort, going back to some primal ways. And for some, you know, my, my practice is full of special needs families. So I get for that mom with three kids with, and one who has autism, she's probably not going to like start homesteading in the next few years. I'm not getting her to knit, but can I get her to go to GAPS diet, right? Mm -hmm. Can I get her to get a crock pot? Can I get her to start making broth and, and cooking real food and stop going through a drive through Yes, I can. I've done it every single time, right? While I'm using the therapies to help recover that child's brain and help them get more function. And then 
And then the next year, can I say, all right, can we, can we talk about the electricity in your house? Can we get some, some shields? Can I, get, can I get you to buy these things that are going to block the EMFs around the bedroom? Oh, yeah, Dr. Oh, okay, great. You know what I mean? We start where they are. And that's what I, my practice is. I don't, I'm not usually asking her to go to the gym because she's exhausted and she needs to learn to sleep. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like uh, I'm trying to learn to do that, bring everybody's frequency down in the house. You know, that's what it is. It is frequency. I'm trying to bring the frequency of the brain connected to the frequency of the earth. When I do that, there is no mental illness. The earth will not make you ill. The earth makes you calm, makes you sleep well, makes you be centered, puts you in alpha, puts you in deep connective meditative state where you can download information and have answers, intuition be very, very strong. Everybody likes alpha. So that's what the earth is doing. So you hunters and you, all of you, any of you out there doing all that, like if that doesn't tell you to like go somewhere remote, just lay on the ground. I don't know how old you are, right? If you're in my forties. I'm 35. Yeah. Okay. So you're younger than me. I don't know if you did this because I'm almost 50. But it was like always a thing to like just lay in the grass and look at the clouds, right? And like play games of looking, thinking about the, like nobody does that now, mm-hmm. right? But it, you're, you, and that's such a powerful neurological practice for children and adults. Mm-hmm. That is doing 10 times what a stupid Sudoku puzzle would be doing. And if you're doing any of those brain games on a stupid device, you're not helping anything. You're making everything worse. I'm like, I would much rather have you lay in the grass and look at the clouds and imagine, imagine things. Imagine using an imagination. Mm-hmm. Do you see a dragon? Do you see your, your mother? Is that baby Jesus? I don't know. <laughs> lay there for 15 minutes and make things up away from all technology, connecting to the earth, dropping down, bringing on alpha and theta waves. That will do more for your brain power than all of these ridiculous you know, apps and things, because it just gets people to sit there and do this and be more addicted to do it. Oh no, but I'm doing a brain game. Yeah. While you're doing a thing that's killing your brain. Right. You know what I mean? It's mm-hmm. like putting, it's like putting aspartame in a brain product and saying, well, it's a brain product, but it has a brain poison in it. So, mm-hmm. right. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Well, there are so many things we could cover today on, like we could, we could go for hours, but I do know that you have engagements and, and we're busy peeps. So, um, where can people find you so that they can go look more into your work and what you do and things that they can do in order to help themselves in their health journey? Yeah, Matt, well, thank you. It was super fun. And I know like I can be kind of all over the place. Like you, we talk, so we just talk about whatever because our first time talking, mm-hmm. right? But certainly, you know, if we're ever going to talk again, if you say, you know, Stephanie, I just want to talk about mitochondria and non EMF, or let's just talk about why you're wearing these glasses. Let's talk about light and blue, blue light or something like, you know, whatever you want to talk about, or ADHD. We can just talk about that, right? Um, so just so you know, like, because I, I have to know everything to kind of do anything. Right? I understand you're fully. With your brain. Yeah. You've and- got to be able to know about the gut. You've got to be able to know about, you know what I mean? Their hormone mm-hmm. system. And, and the reason I had to learn more and more is because so many, they were, they were becoming less and less doctors to refer to for help mm-hmm. because you send them to the endocrinologist, they'd say they're fine. I'm like, they have Hashimoto's. What do you like? There was so much misdiagnosis coming into my practice that I mm-hmm. had no choice, but mm-hmm. to start doing everything because yeah. the misdiagnosis was so bad. I'm like, you don't have ADHD. Or I'm like, you don't have, th-. like, it was like all over the place. I'm like, that's not what you have. It's a thyroid disorder or it's your gut. They didn't tell you this. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. but so you can find me uh, a couple websites, but brainandbodysolutions.com will kind of get you everywhere. And that also is under drrimka.com. I have about 40 domains in that one thing. Um, that's my main website. And I have an online store with products I like ranging from these glasses to LED light panels, to peptides, um, just all kinds of stuff I use in practice to grass fed meats. Uh, you know, it's like just this kind of services I like, um, products and services. Uh, that'll take you also to my e-learning center. I also run courses. So I have a whole other website, brainandbodyrevolution.org, um, where I offer 
some are just short courses and some are 90 day journeys. So I have a whole like year long journey that women can take with me um, that focuses on first kind of like getting into the heat in your own body. It's called the rest, restore, renew class. I teach women to get back in their body 90 days. Then the master's course is kind of a cognitive journey where I go tons and tons into this frequency stuff and mitochondria and light and water and magnetism, um, a lot of quantum physics. That's a 90 day course. And then my M2 master's is kind of a shamanic it journey into the heart and it's more of an immersion where I do groups. So we kind of, we go the, the physical, let's, let's reset your diet. Let's heal your gut. Let's calm your brain neurology. Then let's get a little bit, let's feed your brain, but I'm going to bring spirituality into who you are as a universal creature. Then we go into the deep heart kind of um, woo woo space. Cause I like all of it. Uh, but I also do um, I have forget the fad of a weight loss kind of journey I just started that I really try to flip the switch on that though and focus on emotions mm -hmm. and having loving gratitude for the fat and what it's actually doing for you and getting women out of shaming themselves. And because as where we need to be, you are designed to be lean and strong and have a health. There is a healthy ratio of body composition that is normal. Mm -hmm. And when you go outside of that, it's not healthy. End of story. And it has nothing to do um, with trying to be a certain size. It's just trying to stay human and have optimal performance. That's it, you know? So, and th th we, we know what these are. We know, and we know they're different for different ages. And I take women through that transition. I have a lot of like, you know, the older I get, Connie, the older my people get, you know what I mean? So uh, I, I obviously have, you know, my practice, I, and then in practice, I can see children and stuff, but my, all my courses are mostly for adults. So I have, you know, you can, people can see me one-on-one, -on -one, um, but they can also take courses. And then also I have great product recommendations. So if anybody's like, I don't know what sauna to get. I'm like, you can buy the sauna I have in my house. Here it is. You know what I mean? Like Absolutely. these are the choices I've made through my years of research and why. And so that's, it's just a great place. And many of the links are not even mine. There are many other uh, carnivores. I have a lot of carnivore like links of friends of mine. And I'm like, ah, yeah, put your thing on my website. Cause I can't sell everything, but I want people to find good food if they aren't capable like you and your husband of going out and getting their own elk, mm -hmm. you know, but you mm -hmm. can still get environmentally well-raised white oak pasture kind of meat, right? Yeah. Right off my website or something like that. So, and I love solutions. that. Com. I love it. All right. Well, thank you so, so much, Dr. Stephanie. It was a pleasure and we'll have to do a, a round two on this sometime and tag up again. Cause I feel there's so yeah. much more. I got to talk to you about me. hunting. I'm going to oh. interview you. Okay. Okay. That sounds wonderful. Foot. Yeah. Okay. I love it. I got to learn. It. I want it's, you to teach me. I love it, <laughs> but we'll talk about that. Thank right, you cool. so much. Thank you, Connie.